I love the story of the parable of the sower and the seed. And there's one thing I am convinced of. Every parable that Jesus Christ spoke of was true. When Jesus gives a parable and says, there was a man, there was a man. It was not a figment of his imagination. He was not telling and speaking to us in allegorical terms, but he's talking in real terms that we can understand. And I remember when I first became a Christian, and I was only a Christian of two or three weeks, and the British and Foreign Bible Society, it used to be called in those days, in 1958, was just opening in Canberra, of the Australian Capital Territory, and they made this big stone image they had of the sower and the seed. Now I was so green, I didn't understand very much about this and at all, though I thought up on a farm to a degree, my grandparents had farms and used to do sowing a seed, but I didn't really understand it all. And they had this massive big stone uh, sculpture there of the sower and the seed, it was almost three, foot, three metres tall, they are almost nine foot tall, it was much taller than me. But the one thing I saw about it and I understood was I saw the big bag on his side, the strap around his neck that was holding the, the bag and his hand going into the seed and distributing the seed. And it was, so it gave me a little bit of an idea when I discovered only a few weeks later the parable of the sower and the seed, I got a, a bit of revelation what it meant but still couldn't fully understand it. And then when I looked at this, this uh, sculpture more and more, the so tall sculpture, and I followed it all the way up, and I saw, to my amazement, that the eyes of the sower was closed. So he couldn't even see where the seed was going. Now whether it was intended to be that, I don't know. But to understand the parable of the sower and the seed, I just want to show you one little thing. Because the sow and the seed was talking about conversion. Conversion. But you notice he drew a difference between conversion. He said there is conversion or there is conversion. Have you been conned into a version? And some people have been conned into a version. But I want to sh explain something a little bit e more clearly for you firstly about this. So we'll put it up there. Conversion or conversion. Now underneath I put down here there's a block of land. You can see that little, that strip of land which is a paddock. And I'm going to say its distance is 1.5 kilometres just for the sake of saying it. And uh, now I'm going to suppose, if I'll just move this chair over a little bit to get in, and I'm going to just suppose now, that's one and a half kilometres, and on this side here, and on this side here, people lived. Now how would they, for, how would they travel all the way around to get through that like that? So what was a law that was made to people that they had to have thoroughfares through their block of land or roadways that people could work through. So what the farmer did as he ploughed up and down his field, he ploughed up and down, he found many stones. So he got the stones and he lined the stones up in this way that would make a walkway all the way through and there would be walkways with all the stones round up so people could see which way to walk through and how to get through. And also it was, it was a barriers for people. So then the sower would come out and he's sowing his seed and as he's sowing his seed, going up and down, some of it would fall amongst the stones that he put around the edges. Some of it would fall on the paths that were the walkways that the people were to walk through and how the word of God got underfoot of man. So when he was actually speaking about the sow and the seed, he's actually speaking a very agriculture that people could clearly understand. And I just don't know, I'm not, as you may have gathered, one thing I'm not good at is drawing. <laughs> I'm not renowned for my artistry. 
So uh, we'll forgive that, and I know you will forgive me, but it's to give you just a very rough idea about the sower and the seed and, and how it all operates. And, and if you can get that rough idea, it gives you a better, better idea of what is about to happen and what God is doing. So the whole story begins again as we're reading from that passage of Scripture. And as he spoke these things from Matthew 13 and verse 3, and he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seed fell among the wayside. The wayside. Now what is the wayside? The wayside, uh, which talks us, comes from a, a Greek word which is hodos. And the hodos simply means, and, uh, and so I decided I'd look it up and make sure I got a full understanding of what is the, the wayside. It means a road, a way, or a traveller's road. It was a traveller's road that was a thoroughfare that people had a legal right to go through, even though it is not your property. That is a legal right that, got, that had been given to them, and this was the law that God had handed down to the Israelitish people. And so he said, so fell on the, on the wayside, but in the wayside the birds came down and they devoured them. So he's talking about sometimes a Christian comes to Jesus Christ, he receives the word, but the word is also on that wayside. Now under the wayside, people are walking through it, it's underfoot, so it's trampled down, it's crushed, it's destroyed, and it lasts for about a short time. A short time. A short time it lives in our experience. And this is going to be a challenge, I believe, to every one of us with our walk with Christ. Our walk with Christ, and where do we go in our way with Jesus Christ? So when he speaks about this, and then he said in, in verse 4, it tells us how the birds came down, it was all consumed. And then in verses 5 and 6, he went on to say, and some of it fell in stony places. So they were the stones that were put around the, the roadway, the, the thoroughfares to which you could walk through. And when they fell in amongst those stones, naturally, because they fell amongst the stones, stony places, they did not have much earth there. Because the earth had already been trodden down hard and the stones were placed upon it. They didn't, so they'd spring up very quickly. And they would spring up very quickly, and uh, when they rose up very, very quickly, he went on to say uh, here, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth in the earth. They didn't have a depth in the Word of God. Or did they have an experience in Christ? What was their depth of their experience? You see, one thing, when God saves you, and King David lost this, and King David had to pray to the Lord and said, Lord, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. See, salvation is not yours, it belongs to God. And in the salvation that God gives you, there's a real joy. Can you remember that first day you met Jesus Christ along the pathway? How he came into your life and what a big, big, big impression it made on your life. It made a dynamic difference unto me and to many, many other people as well. But the devil is out watching each one of us. See, I want to tell you one thing, and I didn't discover this for about 15 years as a Christian. I never had anyone to tell me this. I had to discover from the scripture, and I've been sharing it from the scripture since I discovered it, and that is now almost 50 years ago. Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the earth, right? Jesus Christ was slain before the foundations of the earth was made. Now if he was slain before the foundations of the earth was laid, slept, made, he also knew everyone who was going to be saved before the foundations of the earth was laid, right? Otherwise he wouldn't have to die. And because he knew in heaven who they were, and in heaven the most powerful, second most powerful person beside Jesus Christ and his father was Satan. And Satan also knew every one of you who were one day going to be saved. 
So when he was kicked out of heaven, he had his fallen angels on assignment against you. From the day you were born until the day you were born again, Satan was out after you, taking control, trying to take control of your life, trip you up, get you to fall into things, into habits, bad habits, and so far away from God. And he's doing everything he can to do this. And so suddenly when we come to Jesus, that spirit inside of us that died in the Garden of Eden in Adam is now born again and becomes alive for Christ. But do we want it to be born again? That's the seed that Jesus replants inside of our life. But as we read through the parable, there were four types of people that the seed fell into their life. So let's find out firstly about the rest of them. And verse 5, And some fell in the stony places where uh, they did not have much earth and they immediately sprang up and they, because they had no depth inside of them. So that which fell amongst the stony ground comes from the word pet petros, from petros, to which we get Peter the pebble. Petros, petrais, it speaks about it there, ground that was full of rocks. Now Jesus said, and he, from the prophecy of Ezekiel, he said, when you're born again, I want to take outside of you the heart of rock and place inside of you the heart of flesh. That's called a born again experience. Yeah. New flesh. I've got a new heart. I had a stony heart. And believe me, if you knew me before I became a Christian, you would agree with me, I had a stony heart. I had a stony heart. I, I would think the Lord had to come in with a jackhammer plus to break up my heart. But God can do all miracles in his life and a change began to take place. And then in verse 7 he went on to say this. And some fell among the thorns and the thorns sprang up and choked them. Now the thorns were always growing around the rocky edges of the path and, and the farmers cultivated them to a degree because they also built a fence. So I can remember in Tasmania, I'm a Tasmanian by birth, now don't hold that against me because we're lovely people. And uh, <laughs> we're almost as nice as the Kiwis. <laughs> we eat apples and they've got birds that can't fly. <laughs> and our, as a result of this, in Tasmania from Hobart to Launceston, the main highway would go, which is about 180 k's approximately. You didn't think Tasmania was that big, did you? Anyway, it was about as much as the highway was. And on either side of it there, in the old days when the farmers would plough up their fields, they'd get all the bricks, the old stones and make a fence way. Just form a fence. And then they'd grow behind it, behind the fence would grow the, the briar bushes, the blackberry bushes or whatever it was. And even sometimes they would trim them back and train them there to grow over the over the rocks and up there just to make pathways and permanent fences as warnings for people to keep people out from their property. So some of the seed fell amongst the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the stony ground and so it took again shallow roots, but it didn't last long. It says in verse 8, and when it fell there, and this comes from the Greek word, the, the, the ones about the thorns, comes from the word akatha. Akatha which means it fell amongst the bramble bushes, the briar bushes, or the thorns. So the bramble bushes, fire bushes, and these bushes which had very thick thorns and as a warning. So now when they fell amongst that, uh, they, they caused a lot of trouble. So let's go back now or over to the rest of the verses, verses 18. And we read again in verses 18 and 19. Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When some hears the word of the kingdom and they do not understand it, then the wicked one comes and he snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. So you, you let the seed that you got, instead of walk, running with it, you put it on the ground and you tread it underfoot. 
You stample upon it and don't use the word of God. It meant something at that time, but later it becomes very, very shallow into our life. They can't understand it. Why? Because the scripture says the devil comes in and he wants to take that seed out of your heart lest, it, lest you believe and are saved. So because you got the seed, the seed is the commencement of your salvation plan of God. Salvation is not an instant thing, and yet it is an instant thing because of a revelation of God that brought your spirit back to life, but you've got to do something about it. Now, if I have resuscitation, I've got to keep breathing. If I stop breathing again, I'm dead. And when my spirit is born again, my spirit now has got to learn to breathe with the spirit of God inside of me. Otherwise, if I don't let the spirit of God inside of me, I will die again. My spirit that was once born alive, and born alive and came alive unto God. So now something's got to happen. The devil is a master at this. He didn't like the day that you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. He's had all of his angels on assignment about you trying to prevent that day, but suddenly, some way, you got under his guard, you, you heard the voice of God, who was far greater and more powerful than the devil, and God spoke to you in such a way, you gave your life to Jesus. But that day that you gave your life to Jesus, war was declared in the heavens. War was declared in your heart. Satan declared, this day you have declared war on me. Don't believe, and I've often heard many Christian pastors get up and preach from the gospel, oh, give your life to Jesus and everything's going to be a rose bush. I'll tell you what, I found it's not a rose bush, I find all the thorns on the roses and not the leaves. But it's a battle and that is why God takes us through a battle. Why does God take us through the battle? He says in, in Romans chapter 5, he takes us through the battle because it is the development of your character. That's right. Now, I didn't have a very good character before I became a Christian. Most of you wouldn't like to have met me. Anything you did worse, bad, I could do worse. If there's such a word. <laughs> I can do it worse than you. Oh no, you can't. Oh yes, I can. Oh yes, I can. I can do anything worse than you. Until I met Jesus. Change took place. The seed in my heart was under attack. I wasn't going to walk on that seed of God. I was going to go ahead in following Jesus Christ. And so it tells us as we continue on, and in verse 19 it says, or verse 20, But he who received the seed in the stony places, this is he who hears the word of God, and immediately received it with joy. Oh, look at, me, look at all the change! But where is your change next week, next month, next year, next decade? Where is the change? Where is the joy? I have never, ever, ever lost the joy in 63 years of knowing Jesus. What about you? Have you sustained that same joy? I'm not saying you've had joy 24-7, 365 days of the year, but there is an opposition. But even when it's, it, the Bible says when tribulation comes against you, leap for joy. Yes. Yes. Don't let tribulation pull you down. The devil is trying to get that seed out of your heart. When I come under attack, I leap for joy. I praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Why do I praise God? The devil comes in against us wherever he can. I'm going to tell you a story which you've all heard about it, and I'm going to just going to mention it very, very quickly. This young girl was to have a breast removed. Remember I told the story a few, not so many weeks ago. And I prayed for her and God told me, and I told her on that prayer net meeting on that Sunday night in that prayer line, what God was going to do. I'm driving home and the devil attacks me and says, in this most hideous voice in the back of my mind, you failed this time, didn't you? The hairs on my arms stood up. 
the hairs at the back of my hair stood up. The whole of my headlights went dull and a, and a, and a big fog came in over the car. And it's all going on and God said to me, I looked at God and said, God, what's going on? And God said to me, thank the devil. That's all he said, thank the devil. So I said, thank you, devil. And as soon as I said, thank you, devil, God gave me more words to say. Thank you, devil, you are a liar and the father of lies. You have confirmed that she is healed. In John's Gospel, chapter 8 and verse 34, the Bible says the devil is the father of all lies. So he is the father, he is the creator of all lies. I don't listen to the liar, I listen to the Lord. I listened to my Saviour and I said to the devil immediately then, thank you devil for confirming the word of God. Immediately the, the headlights came up, the, the, the fog disappears and, I, and all the hairs were settled down. I had a real peace in my heart and two days later she ran me back totally healed. Praise God. Now I could have submitted, I could have let that seed that I had fall into the, into the stony ground, in amongst the thorns, or even on the walk, walkway, but now my focus was to stay completely on Jesus Christ. And then he went on to say in verse 22, Now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceits and the riches of the world and it all chokes him up. Now, I gave up everything to know Jesus. No, I didn't. Jesus gave me everything to know him. And because he gave me everything, his everything was far greater than what I ever had. So you don't have to give anything up to follow Jesus. But if you, if you want what he's got for you, you haven't got room for what you've already got. You've got to jettison that overboard to receive all that Jesus has prepared for you. Don't get involved with what the world loves, not the world, nor the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world and the things in the world, it's because they don't love the Lord. They haven't had that real conversion with God. And this is what I, I uh, called it here today with our relationship with the devil. Now what I want to show and share with you one thing is this. You might see the top there. Did you have a conversion or a conversion? Did the devil con you? The devil is a liar, the father of lies. When Christ comes into your life, that is pure truth. But the devil wants to try to come in straight after pure, pure truth and take it out. Yes. I've seen people come to Jesus Christ and, and absolutely blind, paralytic, drunk almost. Out of their mind or on drugs and had a great conversion. But where was it in three days, four days, five days or a week or a month later? What God gives is real. God is the real deal. The real deal for you and I. The real deal for everyone. And everyone listening today needs to try and have I been conned by the devil? Because out of those four examples, three of them were. The one that fell on the roadside, the one that fell amongst the rocks, and the one that fell amongst the thorns, they got conned of the devil. They lost their salvation, which God had already given unto them. So that tells me, beloved, you know, I, I believe God works in statistics. And what God's statistics is tells me that 75% out of 100 fell by the wayside. I don't believe Jesus just uses figures and facts and figures and they're, they're only for symbolic. No, they've got a greater, deeper meaning. There's a greater, deeper meaning to what it is. And because the devil moves in deception. And he moves in deception even in the Christian church. I want to tell you something now. As I'm preaching the Word of God, as I'm sharing with you the Word of God, I'm speaking and I'm drawing and I'm trying my absolute best to be in contact with the Holy Spirit, drawing from Him as I'm speaking to you. And I want you to know the devil's also here listening. Yeah. Don't think because we're all under the anointing that he's not here. He is here. 
He's got his, not him himself personally, he's got his cohorts listening and reporting back to him and eyeing off every one of us to see that the devil, these angels can, fallen angels can go back to Satan and tell him because Satan is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere like God is. He's got to rely on his fallen angels to report back to him and try to work and pull us down. Now the scripture says, if therefore, if one in four only make it. I want to tell you one thing for sure as I prayed this morning for Shannon. For Shannon, Luke's Gospel chapter 22 and verse 32, Jesus said, Peter, Peter, Satan has desire that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, and Peter, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Now, how could you imagine now? Here is Peter the Apostle, the mouthpiece, and he had a mouth, he was a mouthpiece, he had foot and mouth disease. He always put his foot in it all the way through. For three and a half years, he walked with Jesus, he talked with Jesus, he sat down with Jesus, he ate with Jesus, he breathed with Jesus, he loved Jesus with every fibre of his being, but yet Jesus said he wasn't saved after three and a half years. Satan has desired that he may sift you with sand. But I have prayed for you, Peter, and when you are converted, got a conversion, when you've got a real conversion, revelation of me, strengthen your brethren. Can you understand what I'm saying? Now, I, I hear so many people say, oh, well, you go out and tell people, if you confess the Lord Jesus Christ with your mouth, you shall be saved. Is that sufficient? No. No, because Jesus Christ himself, and he's the man I follow, he's the man I trust, he's the man I rely upon, he said, he who believes and is baptised shall be saved. Not just give your heart to Jesus, go all the way. Now when I heard about salvation, and the man that told me about it, he also mentioned, he that believes and is baptised, I said to him, what is baptism? And he told me, he said, baptism is being totally submerged into water. Going under, he said, it's not sprinkling. No. It's being buried with Jesus. He said, now, could you imagine if uh, someone dug a hole at the cemetery and dropped you in it there in a wooden box and they just walked over with a handful of soil and dropped it over and said, now you're buried? You'd be like Lazarus, poor he stinketh <laughs> after a few days. He said, no, he has to be completely covered over. Oh, me? I had a phobia, I was scared of water. I used to run that under the shower, I used to keep running around to miss it. <laughs> no, it wasn't quite that bad, but I had a fear of water. My mum put fear in me of water, forbade me to go swimming with all the rest of the kids and things when I was a young kid. But the first words I said to him is, how soon can I get water baptised? So I got baptised the next day. Baptised because I wanted to go the whole hog with Jesus Christ. I wanted to go the whole way. There was no turning back in my life when I made that decision. Transfer, uh, a, a conversion simply means transformation has taken place. What has happened in my life, what happened in my life that day that I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I went through metamorphosis. And in fact, in, in, in uh, Romans here it talks about uh, the word, there's got to be a, a changing, the renewing, and the renewing of our mind comes from the Greek word metamorpho. Now God who wants to change you from being that ugly old caterpillar into the beautiful butterfly. Now many Christians, we were all caterpillars before we met Jesus Christ. And when we had that born again experience, we became a beautiful butterfly. People admire. How many times do you see people admire a caterpillar? You see it on your plants. What, is, what do we do? We go out and kill it. But we don't go out and kill the butterfly. God wants you to be the butterfly advertising out the beauty and the glory of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Coming to the place of having a real and genuine experience in Jesus. 
So Jesus Christ said to every backslider, every person who, who slips away from the gospel, whether they're on the rocky road, whether amongst the thorns or in the stone, Jesus Christ is still praying for them that they will come back as he was for Peter. But I want to show you a true, true story in the Bible. Let's go to Acts chapter 8. In the Acts of the Apostles in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And we're going to go from verses 9 to 15. And in Acts chapter 8, verse 9. Now there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria claiming that he was someone great to whom they all gave heed people listened to him from the least to the greatest saying this man has great power of God real deception there was a de deception was now in operation inside of their life real deception and verse 11 and they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long, long time. Now this city of Samaria was under witchcraft, manipulation, demonic forces and powers. And verse 12. But when they believed Philip, who was preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. They heard Philip preaching the real gospel. And so they now had to line up the imperfect or the perfect gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul, when he wrote to the Christian church, he said, Now, come on, if any man preach any other gospel. There are many gospels. There are even many gospels being preached in the church. But there's only one true gospel written in the precious, precious blood of Jesus Christ. And he's there speaking to them and challenging them again. And he said these words. And so in verse 13, Then Simon himself also believed. Now, that Greek word for believed is pisteo. And that Greek word for pisteo means he adhered to, he trusted in, and he relied upon. But what well on, he's Simon the sorcerer. He adhered to, he trusted in, and he relied upon. And he even went down and got water baptised. But he believed he got water baptised. And then they sent for Peter and John to come down. Read the rest of the scriptures. Verse 14. Now when the apostles who were in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down prayed for them, that they might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now go over to verse 22. And this is what Peter and John said to Simon the sorcerer, the man who believed and was water baptised. He had a conversion, not a conversion. Can you understand what I'm saying? He was conned into his change in life. It was a false relationship he had with Jesus Christ. And they said to him in verse 22, Repent for this, of this your wickedness and pray to God if perhaps the thoughts of your heart may be forgiven you. So the thoughts in his heart, he had a wicked heart. He didn't let God touch his heart. He didn't let that seed of God go into his heart. Deception was living inside of him. And verse 23, For I see you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon the sorcerer answered and said to them, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. Now, here is a con trying to con a converted. Here is a con trying to con a converted. What do I mean by here is a con trying to con a converted? The converted said, no, repent for you in the goal of bitterness. To the pastors in this church, how often do people come up and say to you, oh pastor, pray for me, when they need to repent. Bring them back, don't pray for them, pray that they will repent, but don't pray for them. 
pray. Father, break them. Father, take the false seed out of them. Father, put your love and grace and mercy and the true gift of salvation into them. They're not going to con me. I've been conned over the years. So I'm speaking out of my experience of being conned. If anyone's been conned more, I've been conned more than you. Oh, yes, I have. No, you haven't. Yes, I have. I have. Come on. Learn to discern through God. The only person who knows you are saved outside of the kingdom of heaven is you. And you know what you do that other people know you don't do. And if what you do is outside of the will of God and it doesn't convict you, then you're being conned. Right? Can you understand what I'm saying? You're being conned. Now, I want to tell you something. In, I, I'm not saying... This is true. In all my years of preaching, I've never, and all the sermons I've heard over the years, I've never heard any pastor get up and preach this because they're frightened they'll lose people. But I want to win souls. That's what it's all about. Not losing people, it's winning souls for the kingdom of God. If you don't know the truth, you'll never be set free. You'll never, ever, ever be set free. And we're going to come to know the truth which comes from God. So now what is it? It is here. You see, we've got to start doing the right thing which we're called to do in God. So Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me. Peter and John, will you do the praying for me? No, it's about time you started doing the praying. To the people that you have, the friends you have, the family members that you have, that, that have gone away from God, they've got to come back to the place of being broken and being prayed for. Once they're broken and they start praying to God, you start backing them up with prayer. That's right. But don't let your prayer will not change them unless they're prepared to change. And once they're prepared to change, then your prayer is going to back them up to the hilt and God is going to step down from heaven upon their life, either crush them or raise them up into victory in God. And I'm looking forward to them being raised up into the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. Pampering people is not the answer. True love is hard. True love is hard. You know, when I... Said to, I, I used to get a lot of smacks from my dad for being good. No, I didn't. I got it for being bad. And why did my dad give me a whack? Why did my dad give me a... Because he loved me. He loved me. And that was a just called discipline. And because he whacked me, I, that made me sit up and think. You know, sometimes I got whacked two or three times before I could learn, but I learned. And out of love. And that's because he loved me and cared enough for me and loved me enough. And that's what we've got to learn to do as Christians. Love our brothers and sisters. Love our family. Love our friends. Love everyone. Love is a commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. Love one another. But now there's a difference between love and respect. Difference between love and respect. You may love one another, but you may not respect what they're doing. You don't love what they're doing, but you don't also respect what they're doing. And until there is change, you can't win that respect. But love them, love them into the kingdom. Keep loving, keep loving, keep loving, keep loving and praying for them until there is a change inside of their life. Never give up. Never, ever, ever give up. Never, ever give up. <coughs> in, in the book of Peter, and this is an eye open, was an eye opener to me. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. And verse 3. Okay. 2 Peter 2, oh I'm in the wrong book, no wonder. Huh. Oh, 
I mean 1 Peter, no wonder I can't find it. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3. It says this, By covetousness they will exploit you with the deceptive words. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. Now I want to tell you the Greek word for deceptive words. The Greek word is P L A S T O S, plastos. They've got plastic words. You know, you meet people, and you know when they're speaking, you, they're speaking plastic. They're not speaking real words. They're not real, they're not sincere, they're not genuine, because they're living in deception. They're living in that deception that Jesus Christ came to pull us out of, to bring us out of it, to bring us into a new area of relationship with him. In, in other words, if you are speaking in plastic words, you can't walk in the sun. Because what happens when plastic gets in the heat? It melts, it's useless. If you've got a plastic bucket, it won't hold the water if you put it on the heat. You can't put a plastic bucket on the stove, can you? It won't take heat. And so Christians are, are getting around with plastic words, living in a plastic life, in a plastic society. There's something's got to give. And that's why I believe that when, when Peter also went on to say, and before Jesus comes back, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up because he's going to come back and he's going, to, and he's going to cause the melting of the elements in the sky in the sky there was millions and trillions of tons of pure uh, sulfuric acid up in the skies and when the elements melt and it's only going to increase a few degrees that's going to melt in the skies and bombardment there's going to be fires in diverse places but all of those Christians all of those people living with plastic words they're going to get burnt up because Jesus Christ is coming back for the real you. He's not coming back for a phony. He is coming back for the real you and the real me. And we need to be the real person who we are, the, who, the person whom Jesus Christ died for. And the real you is the one that Jesus Christ put his Holy Spirit in. And he wants his Holy Spirit to live in that which is real, genuine, no fakes, no phonies, but being real. Being real. Now, in saying that, I'm not saying that that's overcome all of your faults, flaws and problems. No, it hasn't, because you've got to work at them. You've got to work at them. You have a look in the book of Philippians, chapter 2. In the book of Philippians, chapter 2, he said this in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved... So, what a wonderful way he addresses it. Therefore, my beloved. He's saying, okay, every one of you at the church at Philippi, I love you. Now, what do you know about Philippi? Philippi, Paul loved every Christian in the church at Philippi. Now, Philippi was positioned between two mountains two mountains and there's a, pa a pathway, a big uh, passageway between these two mountains and in between the mountains a Roman Empire built a fortress and that's where they sent all of their retired military personnel. After they'd served 20 years in the military forces in Philippi, when they retired they sent them and their families to live in this village, in this city. And there were non-military personnel living there as well. But that city was very loyal to Rome. Very loyal to Rome because they served 20 years of long-time service in, in serving Rome. But Paul now had a big problem he had to overcome with these people, convert them to Christianity. And he had that problem with them for a while and he said to every one of those soldiers there that were disciplined soldiers, now they're going to be disciplined soldiers for Jesus. There was a different discipline that was now taking place. And Paul said to them, Therefore, my beloved, you have always obeyed not only in my presence, when I've been present, I've asked you to do everything and you've always done it. You've done it to the T. You've kept your eyes, uh, you've dotted your eyes, you've kept your T's, you've done everything to absolute perfection. 
but now much more in my absence. Now that I'm no longer with you, but I've written this letter to you, and this is the same letter that every one of us is reading right now. And I've written this letter to you. Work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation. They're all saved, but now you've got to work it out. Okay, you have just been represented, I've just said here, yeah. okay, Shaden, I've called you now, and I'm going to put you in the Olympic team for um, 2024. So he's not going to start training in 2024, is he? When's he going to start training? Now. For that day. So why do we go into training? We go into training for that great day when Jesus Christ is coming back. So he said, Now work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. With fear means standing in awe of God. Reverential, holy fear. And trembling is a way of worshipping the Father. So it is with reverential fear and holy Father I stand before you. Holy Father, Holy Father, I stand before you. You know, Holy Father never ever appeared in the New Testament until John chapter 17, when Jesus addresses him as Holy Father. Holy Father. Oh, and he, he, the capital F for Father comes back in Luke 4, but he calls him as the Holy Father. Holy Father, a fear and trembling, having trembling, worshipping before God. Trembling and worship and trembling before God means, God, I'm in your master plan. It means, God, I love you so much. I just love you so much, Lord. It's like a husband to his wife, a wife to the husband, and they love their husband or their spouse so much they don't want to do anything to disappoint them. That's what God wants us to do with our love for him, not step out of his will and cause disappointment to him. I don't want to hurt my God in any way. Now, when I stand here, can I stand here and say, I've never hurt my God in any way? No, I can't. I wish I could. I wish I could turn back the clock and say, God, I, I, I haven't. But I've made those mistakes over my 60 odd years as a Christian. But God has always been there to pick me up, pick me up, brush the dust off me, dust me down, and encourage me and put me back on the right track and say, keep walking, keep walking. The only thing I hope he never gets behind me with his finger and gives me a flick, because you can imagine the hand of God, how big it is. He just sent me from one end of the earth to the other. <laughs> But here it is, God is moving, God is moving, God is moving inside of our lives. When I, in my early days of becoming a Christian, I heard possibly one of the most misquoted scriptures I've ever heard in my life. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, I've got to work at that. I've got to work at that. It's not already happened. I've got to work at it. So it says, therefore, therefore, if, this is the big if, if, and the question is tonight, this morning, today, tomorrow, yesterday, whenever it might be, but right now, if is this, are you in Christ Jesus right now? See, when Jesus said, I am in the Father and the Father in me and I will be in you. See, he wants me to get into him. Into him. Making his impression on planet Earth, not mine. I'm not here to convince people. I'm not here to win people over. I'm not to show people how good I am. I'm here to show how good my God is. How great is my God? How great and mighty is he? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, get into him. The first three people were they were conned. Their version was not God's version. They had another version of another gospel. 
And Paul the Apostle said, And if any man preach another gospel, let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. Maranatha. Let him be accursed. But I want you, beloved, to come and to know the true gospel, the real gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Now, how do you know you're a new creation? Behold, all things become new. Okay, all the old things that David Williams had before he became a Christian, are they still alive in me? All the old things in your life before you became a Christian, how many of them are still alive in you? God is working on you. God will work on you until the day Jesus Christ comes back. But how do we claim the victory? In Revelation 3 it tells us very clearly, and having done all to stand having done all to stand. When I'm under opposition, do I do all to stand? I might stumble, I might fall. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and God delights in his way. Though he fall, the Lord is always there to uphold him and to lift him up. Come on, David, you stumble, you fall. But I'm here to lift you up and keep your feet, keep your feet on solid ground and look and keep walking ahead. Keep walking ahead. Keep walking ahead. Keep walking ahead. Keep the focus on Jesus. Don't take Jesus for granted. It is an honour and a privilege to be called a son and a daughter of the living God. Never outgrow or overstep the mark of the great privilege. What an honour, what a privilege it is to be a son and daughter of the living God. What we need to do is work out our own salvation. Get into our own spiritual gym. Start working out now, working out now, working out now. Picking up the weights, picking up the barbells. Not the dumbbells, picking up the barbells, the barbells. Come on, pick them up and start building up and building up your muscle, building them up. And as you do, you keep getting into heavier and heavier weights. Learn to dis if you're going to work out, it means learn to discipline yourself. Discipline yourself. Don't be trodden underfoot. Don't let the, walk, the devil and others walk all over you. Hold your ground that God has given unto you. Don't have a stony heart. Jesus said, Beloved, I've taken out of you the heart of stone. I've put inside of you a heart of flesh. Now be led by that heart. Don't be led by the patterns of the past. But Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, The patterns... The customs of the old have been set, you've been set free from them. I've been set free from them. You have been set free from them. Don't get caught amongst the stones and amongst the thorns. Let your heart be set aright. I'll tell you, and finish on this point. Acts chapter 5. Two lovely Christian people, Ananias and Sapphira. Two lovely people, love the Lord, love the Lord with all of their hearts, serve God, very generous in their giving. And suddenly it says in, in Acts 5 and verse 3, it says, and then they gave their property, what they had to the Lord. So generous were they. And when they gave it, and verse 3 says, and the devil came in with the seed into their heart. Into their heart. And their heart, he see, what he did, he snatched away that flesh and he put a bit of stone in their heart and the stony heart started to take control again. They said, oh goodness me, I gave to the Lord that block of land. And I only thought it was worth 10,000, but they ended up selling it for 80,000. So let's keep some of it back. See, they were happy to give it all to God. But then, and then they were given an opportunity to repent. An opportunity to repent, but did they repent? No, they had to let the devil even make their heart harder and harder. And so they, they, they said to them, 
What have you done? Why have you sinned against the Holy Spirit? And so they dropped down dead. And they rolled them up in the mat and took them out. A few hours later during the day, the spouse, not knowing what had happened, came in and said the same thing. And they said to, the, to him as well, why have you sinned against God? Come on, God gave you a heart of, heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. God gave you a heart of flesh. And they wouldn't repent, so they fell down dead. Beloved, because of when Jesus Christ comes back, and I want you to take this to heart, and those watching on this uh, recording as well, take this to heart. Before Jesus comes back, he's coming back for a spotless church, a church without spot and wrinkle. And there will be no Anaphias and Sapphiras in the kingdom of heaven. I'm sorry I'm not being judgmental. I don't want to sound judgmental. I'm not really judgmental. But if it's there, he's coming back for a perfect church, a perfect church without spot or wrinkle or blemish. Yes. We will not have Anaphias and Sapphiras back in the church. Pray for them that they have that new heart again, their heart replaced with the heart of flesh, communicating, connecting with Jesus Christ. Let them connect, let them grab, let them grab what God has given to them and let them be the change, change inside of our heart. And the change in my heart is this, Lord Jesus, all I want is you. What I want to do, Lord, is please you. That is one good thing with our, the arrangement with my wife and I. In the 35 years we've been married, she knows. She knows that I love Jesus more than I love her. And one thing I know without a shadow of a doubt, my wife loves Jesus more than she loves me. And out of that, we live in a life without compromise. Jesus comes first in both of our lives. And if Jesus is not first, he's last. He's not second. He's either first or last. He's either in or out. There's no difference. There was only that one sin that made the difference between in and out of the kingdom of God. To you, beloved, where is your heart today? Where do you stand today? How much do you love today? How much do you really know and understand conversion? Unfortunately, so many people are away today sick. But tonight, I want to share with you the perfect conversion. The perfect man with the perfect conversion. And I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about someone else. The perfect man with the perfect conversion. If you're interested in what I know, you come along tonight and find out how and what is required inside of our lives. Today, if you're not satisfied with that relationship and conversion, I'm going to ask you right now, an invitation I extend to you, I can only give you an invitation, but you can take it up or deny it. But will you bow your heads with me? And if you feel the necessity in your life to say this, this prayer that I'm about to say, just repeat it after me. Lord Jesus Christ, I come before you. I've heard more today about conversion. I want the real deal. I want the real thing. I don't want a counterfeit. I invite you, Jesus, come deeper and deeper into my heart. Reveal to me the things of my life that must be done away with. I want to hand them over to you that they can come under your blood and I can be washed clean in your blood with a genuine experience. I don't want plastic words. I want words of life for myself and for those to whom I meet. 
I want to be real. Help me, Lord Jesus. I speak the paradox. Let the weak say I am strong. I'm going to believe, Jesus, that you're making me strong by defeating my weakness. Thank you, Jesus, that you're here and you answer prayer. Amen. Now, Father, as we have prayed, you have heard the call of your people. Thank you, Father, for the word that has been delivered today. I pray, Holy Father, that these words will remain deep in our spirit and will cause a challenge to rise up inside. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.